I'm at a reality at this point. Like, what in the hell do I got my eyes on? I could not get up like I was that scared. It changed my whole life. Welcome back to the Crypto Creatures Podcast. This is Brian. This is Todd. How you doing, Todd? I'm doing good, sir. How are you? Fantastic. Right on, right on. Just have, chilling like a villain. Having here. a good weekend so far? Staying busy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Went to uh, Costco today. That was a dumb idea. That was, sounds awesome. <laughs> they weren't busy at all, I'm sure. Yeah, on a Sunday, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, man, we're, we're getting close to a thousand listens already, dude. I know I am so I can't tell you how grateful we are for all of you listening and supporting the show. Absolutely. It's awesome. Yep. Yep. We appreciate it all. And uh, come join our Facebook group. If you're not on it already, we've got a group on Facebook, Cryptic Creatures. We're trying to grow that, get as many members on there and uh, trying to get more people to come on and do some more episodes. We've got some lineups going on, but the more, the, the more, the better. That's right. Yeah. So you can always email us at uh, info at cryptic creatures dot co and uh reach out to a story that way facebook or instagram at cryptid creatures that's right got a twitter handle don't we we do uh at cryptid creature one it's at cryptid creature no e on the end of creature and the number one right on you know what else is cool brian is we're on youtube now aren't we we are on youtube on cryptid creatures hell yeah you can get us there too. Right on. I was I was listening to us on YouTube the other day. It was really and neat. Eventually, we will get uh, you know video, video going up there. <laughs> yeah, when we get ourselves in shape and looking better, we're gonna get right. behind the camera well, for you <laughs> if that's possible. Yeah. <laughs> that's really not what it is. We're just technically trying to get no, through this all. Just, but yeah, we're good looking enough the way it is. So we have some stuff to figure out, but right. we'll get it. We'll get it, and we'll get it to you guys, and it'll be fun. Exactly. So we have a guest. Tonight show, Brian, three encounters. Yeah, big show. Big Bigfoot show. encounters. First two was kind of a, a tease, I think, for, for the poor guy, and then it showed its face to him. So That's right. Yeah. And uh that one was a little farther south there in Ohio. That was down around Cincinnati area, area we're talking yeah. there. Yep. I just realized too, uh, he's not far from the Daniel Boone National Forest, maybe an hour, hour and a half drive or something like that. So it's uh, interesting. I know. Yeah. All right, so we're going to bring Jeffrey on. You ready to bring Jeff on? Uh, yeah, let's do this. All right, man. We'll bring him on. Jeff, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for coming on. We appreciate it so much. Yeah, Thank you we really do. Me. Thanks. How you doing, Jeff? What's going on, man? I'm just chilling on Sunday. Right on. Uh, doing research. Yeah, right. So you've got about three encounters to talk about on this episode, Um how old were you when each one of these encounters took place? I was eight at my first encounter, uh, 16, my second, and 24, 25 on my, my third and last encounter. Wow. Okay, gotcha. Um, before your first encounter, did you did you believe this was with, these were all Bigfoot encounters, correct? Uh, no, I really was a non-believer, you know, like I just... My, you know, I heard stories from family members. You know, my, I, had, I had family from Arkansas, Virginia, and, you know, we'd hear all the stories that they talked about. But, you know, we were just, just too young to even know any better of what was really out there and what wasn't. You know what I mean, but I learned very quick at a young age what was out there, you know. Where did you grow up, Jeff? Uh, Norwood, Ohio, right outside of Cincinnati. Okay. And that's where most uh, – I'm sorry? Uh, a place uh, – on the top of our city, it was, it was called, we had a, a sacred piece of land that was called Indian Mound. Uh, we lived right at the bottom of the hill of that place. Okay, gotcha. Um, cool. So why don't you uh, tell us about your first encounter? Tell us what you're doing and hanging out and what happened and didn't and all that okay. stuff. Okay. Um, well, I, I got up every day and took my sister to school because she was a couple years younger than me. 
and we had a lot of bullies, you know, growing up where I grew up. So I'd get her to school every day, but we'd always take out, you know, a different route, opposite route as the kids. Uh, we'd go up to the top of the hill, and across the street was a, a set of woods, and they were, you know, very sacred. The place was called Indian Now, uh, Indian Burial Ground, and uh, the Indians had done some other things up there as well. Um, and coming home one day, um, walking my sister home after school, uh, I hear a whoop out of nowhere, you know, just come out of nowhere. And I look behind me, and a rock hits the street right next to me and my sister. Hmm. And so I'm looking behind, I'm looking for kids, I'm looking for bullies, you know, like maybe they tracked us down. They're going to mess with me and my sister today. But I didn't see anything, you know, and I scoped as far as I could see. Uh, were you guys by shit. some woods? Yeah, we were right next, we were right across the street from the big section of woods, you know, probably a good 100 acres. Uh, they were directly across the street from where we were walking. So I turned around again and just, you know, I grabbed her hand, I, you know, because I was thinking bullies at this point, maybe, you know, maybe behind some bushes or something. And another whoop, and then uh, the rock landed even closer to us. Now, it didn't hit us, but when it broke, some of the pieces did shear off, you know, into pebbles and hit me and my sister to where we jumped. How big were the rocks, Jeff? Jump on feet. It, it, it scared us that bad. How, how big did you say the rocks were? Uh, they were probably, you know, hand size. Hand okay. size, good, you know, at least two, three pounds. Uh, as the second one hit, I looked behind me and still see nothing. So I look over towards the section of the woods. And I look in this opening. This is like early spring. Nothing had bloomed yet. And in between the section, there was a pocket where, you know, it was clearly, uh, you know, used by something. Um, maybe kids, you know, playing in that section of the woods or whatnot. And at that opening was something humongous sitting in between those trees. Now, it had one hand on each tree, and it was in the open pocket, but it kept moving left to right. Um, it started shaking the trees, but as it did, it kept moving its head, basically, like it just didn't want its face seen. Now, but I seen, you know, it was daytime, middle of the day, so I clearly seen the outline of this thing, because whatever it was, huge, and it was all muscle, and it was a, at least seven, 800 pounds. Like, this thing was immense. It was as high as those saplings were, you know. They were probably eight, nine foot tall. This thing had to be at least eight foot and immense. I mean, but it was quick. It was moving so fast, I couldn't see its face. But I seen the whole outline of everything else. That's how big this thing was. And it was gray. It was black with grayish running through it. And it was layered, you know, hair because it was clearly blowing in the breeze, you know, off its legs and everything. I couldn't see its feet, but like I said, but I seen any, everything from like the ankles up to the, the neck area because it kept moving so defensively and basically with its head, it was like it, you know, I was at that point, I was in shock. Like, what is this thing? You know, it's like, is it, is it going to attack us? Is it, is it lost? I mean, I clearly thought this thing was maybe just lost, you know, come down a section of the woods and just got lost. You know what I mean? Um, Jeff, but, how far away from you was this thing? Do you think? I was about maybe, I'm going to say about 120 to 150 feet. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it wasn't that far. It's funny. You mentioned that it had its hands on trees uh, moving side to side and its arms stretched out on trees. We've heard that story before. Right, Brian? Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. That but behavior. It kept moving its head back and forth. You know, I could get a glimpse, but not really a full description of what its face looked like. Now, but I know, you know, it wasn't a gorilla. This thing was way bigger than anything I'd ever seen in my life. And at 800 pounds, I mean, this thing was monstrous. It was straight upright, you know, standing straight up. And uh, after the second rock hit, and I looked back, you know, and I, I put eyes on this thing. And my sister's looking back with me at this point, And I know she's got eyes on this thing. I just immediately, I turn and tell her to bolt. And we run, you know, we was only a half block from home. So I told her to bolt. We hit the right, you know, right-hand turn to get down to our house. And we hit the house. I bolted through the door. And as soon as I got in the door, I told my mom, I said, hey, you know, there's clearly a you know, monster or something up in the woods that was sitting up there in the open pocket throwing rocks at us. You might want to call the police because this thing may hurt somebody, you know, another group of kids coming down through there. Like, we were clearly shook. And, you know, all his mom said was, you kids, you know, you kids today are crazy as hell. Just get, get your ass back in your room and do your homework. <laughs> I was pretty upset about it. You know, we were shook. Um, so that night we go, you know, we're back in our room and I was not, I didn't even sleep that all, that all night. And I don't even think my sister didn't either because we were afraid that something was going to come through our back window by the woods 
you know, and come through the window and snatch, you know, one of us or both of us, you know. So, hey, Jeff. Really did, didn't, yeah, really didn't get no sleep that night at all. Jeff, did you notice a smell or an odor when you were encountering this this thing? No, no. I mean, there was a little breeze that day, but I did not have any warning of any smell. And that was what's weird because I hadn't had that in anything that I've encountered. You know what I mean, in any of my three that I ever have any smell, which is ironic. I mean, it's kind of wild, but, you know. Uh, Jeff, what was the name of the town you, you, you had this encounter in? Norwood, Ohio. Okay. Right outside of Cincinnati. Uh, so, we you know, we never went back up that way. From that day forward, if we went to, you know, if I was taking her to school, which I did, we were going up Harper, which was, you know, the, the street at the bottom of the hill. Furthest away from that set of woods, you know, as possible. And we never went that street again. Now, I did later, and, you know, as I was growing up and an older man, you know, but I was always, every time I was up on that street by those woods, it didn't matter day or night. I was always... So, you know, just, just extra cautious about, it, you know, things because I knew what happened up there, you know, with, and like I said, there was nothing ever even said about it, you know, to anybody else in the town because, you know, the way mom put it on us that day when we, you know, tried to tell her, you know, we, know, we never spoke of it to nobody, not even the kids. So nobody even never, ever even knew about this, even to this day. I just decided, you know, at then this is all, you know, this is all really suppressed by my, you know, at the end of my third encounter with my dad and my uncles. I was to keep it all secret because of the shit that, you know, we all get from the naysayers and the government and what have you. So, you know, nothing was really much said of it until this, these past two weeks, I've been doing all these interviews. So this is the first, you know what I mean? That all my stuff has really been out there. Okay, cool, cool. Right. So why don't you uh, tell us about your second encounter? What happened there? What was going on? Okay, well, um, we were taking a break from where we usually fished around our town locally. Down on Route 32, there was a section of the Miami River, but it was burned up, you know, from all the fishing. So we decided to go up to a place called Lake Cowan. It's in, up in northeastern Ohio. Out of ways a little bit, but just needed a break. So we went up there that day to fish. We got up there before everybody else. We got a boat. We get out to the opposite side, you know, to just get away from everybody. And we come up on this killer spot to fish. So... We tie on our baits, and we both decided to use the same thing, a, a silver spoon. And I go to the back of the boat, and I tell him, get to the front, but please, brother, don't don't snag me. Please, whatever you do, don't snag me. We're in a perfect spot, you know, and so we go to fish. Well, I throw my spoon, and I'm real mind, you know, and we're fishing for muskie, basically, or bass, whatever's going to hit, because that was the two, you know, well-known fish that were in that lake. His first cast, he... As I'm reeling my bait in, I feel my hat go off into the water, and I feel a jerk on my ear. He had put that spoon right through my ear. <laughs> Ouch. Clean through it. Clean through it. Damn. So I'm like, you mother effer, uh, take me to the boathouse. You know, I got to get this out of my ear. It's bleeding like crazy. I uh, said, you know, and we'll see We'll see what happens from there. So we get over to the boathouse, and the, the clerk's already out in front waiting for us. We were directly across from him. He's seen exactly what had happened. So he's waiting out there with a stick and a pair of snips. And he's like, I told you guys, you ain't supposed to hook each other. You're supposed to hook the fish. <laughs> and he laughs. Well, I'm not laughing because I'm upset at this point. This thing's throbbing. So he says, well, come in the band house and, and, and grab the stick and bite on the stick. And I'll get see if I can get that out of your ear. So we walk in. I bite on that stick. He grabs the snakes. The snips, metal snips that he had pop. I feel a pop. And then he slides that spoon out of my ear. So at that point, I'm, I'm just... I'm, Kind of hurt him. I'm like, let's just go home, you know. He's like, well, what about going to Todd's Creek? He says, not far. And the white bass are running, so maybe we can get on there. Maybe we'll get a muskie or a white bass from down there. So I agree, you know. After about 10 minutes of debating just to see if my ear would quit bleeding, I decided to go. So we get there, and it's out in the middle of nowhere. All you got soybean field. You can see deer running through the fields. Still kind of early that morning, like 7.45, around that area. So you get out of the truck, and there's a huge farm. But you got to go about 600, 700 yards to get to the creek itself. There's a hole in the fence. And he knew the farmer that owned all that land. We had permission. So, you know, I agreed. Let's, you know, let's just go ahead and try it. So we get there, and he's down about 25 feet below me. And I'm up closer towards the waterfall. 
That's just crystal clear water. It's beautiful. And I'm jacked at this point. We're going to burn them up. And out of nowhere, like 15 minutes, 15 minutes in there, 20 times being in this place, a rock. I'm looking at the opposite side of the bank as I'm casting, and I see a rock coming right in at me. But I guess it was stunning at an angle because when it landed, it landed beside me. And I'm freaking. I look down at him, and I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you trying to, are you trying to hit me with rocks, bro? And he's like, you, clear, you, see, you clearly see me reeling my reel, you know, my rod at my line. And he said, how could I throw a rock with both my hands on my pole? And I'm like, quit, just quit tripping, bro. If you did it, did it. He's like, no, come on, man. You know, I'm, you know me better than that. We're here to be serious. I said, well, that's what I was hoping. So, you know, we let it go. I don't think nothing else of it. But I'm wondering in the back of my mind, what the hell? If he didn't throw it, who threw, you know, who threw that? Because well, we're out in the middle of nowhere. And then not even, not even 10 minutes later, the same thing. Rock coming right at me. It lands right beside me. At this point, I look at him. And when I look at him, he's already locked eyes with me. And as soon as we lock eyes, we are gone. I mean, we're in the middle of the creek in about three foot of water with no waders on. And we're peeling, trying to get up out of the water to get up onto the bank to be gone. You know what I mean? Yeah. We are spooked. <clears throat> so we're at the edge of the bank. And the water coming off of us is hitting the mud on the bank, and there's a little incline. So we're slipping and falling, trying to get up out of this creek. And at the same time, he's saying, what the hell was that? What the hell was that? That wasn't me. What was that? I mean, what throws rocks at you out in the middle of nowhere? He said, it's not even 8 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, and we're out in the middle of nowhere. He's like, you know, something is off. And I said, this whole day has been off, bro. <laughs> and so we get through the cut of the fence, and we, we're running to the truck. And this truck's still like, you know, 550 yards away. And we're soaking wet. And I'm scared to death. And he's, he's, he's more scared than I am at this point. Cause he knows he didn't throw it. <clears throat> so we get about to halfway through the, you know, that line on the farm. And we're about 300 yards away from the truck. All of a sudden out of nowhere, you hear a, a pack of probably about 10 coon dogs and they're running something through the woods back where we just were. So now I'm super freaked. Like, are them wild dogs? I mean, I don't know. They sound like coon dogs to me, Chris. What do they sound like to you? He said, that's coon dogs. But why would they be running? They don't run coons in the daytime. So we bolt even quicker. He's like, come on, we got to go. We got to get the truck. So we get to the truck, and we throw the poles in the back of the bed. And my door is open, so I jump on in on the passenger side. And he jumps in the driver's side. But he is so shook by what just happened, he can't even get the keys in the ignition. So I grab him out of his hand, and I just slide the key in. I turn it over, and I tell him to peel. And that was it. We never went back. Jeff, did you say you did see something, though? or No, I didn't see shit that day. I didn't see nothing. Okay. But I felt like I was being warned when that second rock come in. I felt like that was a warning. Because, like, mm -hmm. you know, you're thinking everything possible with that. I mean, logically, like, what could this be? But in all honesty, you know... 7.45 in the morning on a Saturday in the middle of nowhere, you know, all the, nothing's around you but woods and farmland. You know what I mean? Like you're out, we're out in the middle of nowhere, Hickville in a creek, you know, did it take you back? Did it take you back to your side that those rocks come from? It was all woods. So where did the rocks come from is what I was thinking. Jeff, did it take you back to your incident you had when you were younger with your sister? Did you start thinking sure, about that? It, it sure did. It sure did. But not until later in the day. You know what I mean? Because I was that spooked. Yeah. I didn't really put it all together until later, you know, uh, after we got home and stuff. So we didn't go back there. We started going back down and fishing where, you know, we used to fish. But then we started hearing stuff about our older friends, you know, the older guys, you know, the, the generation up from us. That was their spot. But they would always fish the opposite side of that part of the river on 32. Then we would fish. We would fish like a... The lower flat side, there was a big concrete slab, and the woods were open, but they liked to fish the other side, and it was thicker, you know, because they liked to drink and party. Mm -hmm. But everybody was, was already talking stories down there, because there was always, there was a, um, a local speedway, gas station, everybody stopped at. And everybody started, you started hearing stories about some wild man that looked like somebody just dropped him off one day in the woods and never went back and got him. And they were saying how he was running through the woods, you know, in the middle of the day and night, tearing up people's stuff, you know, their campsites and shit. So that kind of spooked us. So I really quit fishing with him after that. 
<laughs> period. You know what I mean? <clears throat> maybe. Like, yeah, maybe he I didn't want to fish with you. I quit fishing for a minute altogether after that. Mm-hmm. After we went back down there, I heard that, you know? They kind of sealed the deal for me. Right. You know, right. These things, these things kind of like to throw rocks at you, it seems, though, Jeff. Yeah, that's what I've learned now. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of research lately, and I've got some friends that are pretty up there, you know, in the higher, you know, notches of the, of the belt when it comes to the subject, like you all. And they're teaching me a lot of stuff that I had no clue about. You know what I mean? So the things I didn't know, I know now, which it's already been confirmed with me anyway. What I seen the third time, you know, really locked it in for me. All right. Because Right. There was no, no no denying what I'd seen and what I knew. You know what I mean? Gotcha. It really it was a full on so close. Like it changed my whole life. Why don't you tell it's us about Go ahead and tell us that one. We're listening, uh, bud. I was on the border of Ohio and Indiana by Miami Whitewater Park. Uh a whole uh, body of my uncle Mike's. Malcolm Mike was the ex army ranger, did two tours in Vietnam. One of his buddies had owned some land right next to Miami Whitewater Forest. So we were allowed to go with fish whenever we wanted. But we never night fished. <coughs> so this night, Malcolm Mike decides he wants to go and night fish for some crappie. So we get there. We didn't take a lot of gear that day. It was kind of hot. It was like 80, 85. And we got there about two o'clock. And the climb up there, we, it, it almost, it was just so brutal. Uh, you couldn't carry much anyway. So we all packed light. We didn't really take, but maybe, you know, what you were drinking, you know, you weren't taking, you know, to any, any more than one, you know, drink. Mm-hmm. I usually took about a 20 ounce stock of pepper, my fishing pole, and a minnow bucket. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that was it. And that's what they did because this climb would kill you. It would start <laughs> flat. And by the time you got to the top, you were at a 90 degree angle. Like, in, you would eat, once you got to the top, you were, you threw all your gear down and you were sucking wind. <laughs> with your, you know what I mean? Like, it was that bad. It must have been a good fishing spot. But it was. And there was even a better lake on up, up above, about on the north side of Lake One. It was Lake Two, but it was about 150 yards more higher. And there was a ridge that went all the way back around to the backside of Lake Two. And on the left side of the lake was all straight thick woods. I mean, it was all the way around, but that side was worst. And it was a steep incline. You know what I mean? Like, it was shit. It was a super 90, I'll tell you that. Mm-hmm. So nobody ever wanted to go fish like two. You were burnt out from the climb to get the one. And the cows always stayed over on the left-hand side. They, he had a herd of cows up there that he had, and they always stayed up on that side because that's where all the shade was. And uh, I didn't know, you know how this was going to pan out because you know we'd never seen what they did you know whether whether they moved or not at night time so we're up there we finally get up there and we're fishing and we're barring them up we're i mean just lighting them up but i mean you know from two o'clock and you're you're having a blast like time just flew before we knew it it was time to switch over to night fish Mm -hmm. so we all switch over and we're still catching you know crappie and bass everything all together because you know, that time of season, late September, everything's kind of hitting, you know, getting built up for winter. So we were having a blast that day. Well, night come quick, about 12 o'clock, the cows that were on the left-hand side, about 10 of them, they just get up and just leave out of nowhere. And instead of going to the right side that sloped down to the river in the woods, where they usually went in the daytime, they went around and up to Lake too. You know, and behind some trees and cover up there. And, you know, I didn't think nothing of it because I've never been up there night fishing. And neither did my uncle or my dad. No, nobody knew, you know, nobody had a clue because we'd never been up there at night. So, you know, nights comes and it's about midnight up on the left ridge that wrapped around back to late two. We heard something, I heard something coming down off the ridge, but it was moving slow and evasive, you know, moving, stop, moving, stop. I thought deer, and that's what I always thought, you know. Anyway, being in any stretch of the woods, you hear shit like that, you think, you know, at nighttime, you think deer, right? you know, just being defensive. <laughs> so I didn't think nothing of it, you know, I just shrugged that off, and we're, we're still catching them decent. But then about an hour later, like, everything just shut down out of nowhere. So I'm like, well, hell with it. 
I'm going to go ahead and set up with this lip bomber and uh, use my minnows. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I switch over, and we've only, we ain't got no fire going. You know, it's me, Rocky, Dad, and Mike. And they're all three fishing, you know, the front part of the lake closest to the hill. And they're all packed in there together. Nobody's talking. You know, we've been quiet the whole night. And uh, that's what's ironic is because after the first time I heard that sound up there, didn't hear it no more. So I grabbed the lantern, and we're so close to each other because, you know, Lake One's pretty small. Uh-huh. So I figured I'm going to take this lantern, and I'm going to put it at the turn, and I'm going to go over to my spot. You know, it's by a foot little hole over there nobody knows about. And I'm going to go catch a couple more, you know, because we got super competitive when we were up there. So I make my move. I go to make my move over to the left side. And I grab it in a bucket of the turn, and I set it off to the left, and I put the lantern up to see where I was going to go to see where my spot was. You know, because the woods were so bad on that side. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it sucked. I mean, you, it was hard to fish. You had to cast sideways to get in. So I put the light up to see where I'm going. And I put the light right on something. It was crouched down right next to the lake. It had its right hand in the water. And its hand was huge. And when I put the light on it, I guess it sensed it had some, you know, light on it. It started to raise its hand out of the water real slow. And I guess it was trying to get a drink because, you know, its hand was cupped when it come out. And it, it poured it out so slow, I could see the water dripping from his hand. And I'm froze stiff at this point. Like, what in the hell did I just put light on? Because when I first seen the color, I thought, dear. <laughs> but after you see what you see and that hand coming out, I was froze stiff with fear. Now, as it see, I guess as it, it senses it's got light, it's pulling its hand, it's turning its head over its left shoulder. And as it's doing that, its mouth's open, and it's growling real low, like a rabbit dog, real low, slow, like a dog that's just fucking ready to kill something. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I hear my dad now, vaguely, you know, very like, I'm out of reality at this point. Like, what in the hell do I got my eyes on? And I hear them saying, Junior, what is that? What the hell is that? Do you see that? And it's all of them saying it. And I'm not saying nothing because I'm pro stiff. And this thing's looking at me at this point, and it's looking back at the woods. It's got its head to me, but I can see when I put the eyes on it, its eyes were yellow. They glue like a yellow. So I could see its eyes. That's how close I was to the thing, probably 40 feet top. That's how close I was to this thing. So I know what it was. And it's glancing like it wants to run, but it's not. It's froze. It's not moving. And it's looking at me, looking at the woods, looking at me, looking at the woods. And finally, you know, I, they come to me a little bit louder. What the hell is that? And I say, go bolt. And they jumped. I mean, they ran and just jumped off the side of this hill. Small mountain. You guys, so you told him to take off running, and you took off running too. Go, I said, go, go now, run, run, get off this mountain, run now, go. And they listened; they were gone. Jeff, and that's when I that's when I realized they seen what I seen. Can you describe any of the face facial features of this thing? It had it had the coning of the head, but it wasn't intense, you know, or as big as. You would, you would think it could be. Like they talk about the adults. This thing wasn't, this thing was maybe 500 pounds tops. It wasn't huge. Mm-hmm. Looking back on it, I've learned it may have been a juvenile, you know, because his head wasn't coned. It wasn't huge. It was muscular and impressive, but it just wasn't humongous, you know. Okay. It had, it had layer, layers of fur, cinnamon color, beautiful cinnamon color. It wasn't matted, you know. At all. And the first one, you know, that blackish gray, the black grayish one in, in Norwood was kind of mad, but it wasn't bad, bad neither. And this one, it was beautiful to lay out. Now, I don't know, because all the water being around that area, you know, it's maybe it had tracked through the rivers and shit, you know, and cleaned itself up. There was no smell of this thing either, and I was 40 feet on it. Hmm. It had the cone head, it had four canines, but they were kind of. Rounded, they weren't sharp, like in any shape or form, like you would, you would think, you know, something out in the wild would be like a wolf or 
you know. Uh, but but definitely had like canines. That. It looks so, kind of worn down a little bit. More human like? Hair all the way up to his cheek. The hair stopped right underneath the eye bone, the cheekbone, the upper cheekbone. It went all the way down into like a little beard in between the chest. I don't chest. know if he can hear me. Uh, uh, Jeff, was it more? Huge, Jeff, was it more? Huge eye socket. Jeff, was it more human-like looking, or was it more gorilla or ape-like looking in the face? Can you? This was half and half. You know, I've seen so much of of each one. You know, in that 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 whatever it was itself. I mean, uh, at, when I by the time I ran and boarded, I knew what I had my eyes on. I knew what it was. It was confirmed for me right there on the spot. Mm-hmm. And I knew what it was. Well, but at this point, I'm thinking, how am I going to get off the bottom of, you know, get to the bottom of this mountain without getting killed? And it was crazy because halfway down this, this mountain, like fear was so bad in me. When I fell, because I raised the lights to see where we were going, I slowed down a little bit and they took me out because I passed them up. I passed them up like lightning. But when I raised the lights to see where we were going on the way down, they took me out. We all rolled down the hill. And I could not get use of my leg. I could not get upright. I was that scared. I don't blame you. I would be too. I'd be running running for my life. Yeah, me too. I mean, I'm crashing into stuff. I'm crashing into sides of trees, trees on the ground, you know, stumps. I'm hitting rocks, big ones. And I'm trying to stop myself and push up, you know, onto my feet so I can run. But fear has got me. It's got me gripped. I can't use my legs. It's like... They're gone. And I thought, well, I'm dead. So I'm waiting any second for, you know, this thing or these things. Maybe there's more at this point to just come and get me where it's going to, you know, they're going to come get us all, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's where it takes you, you know, fear takes you to that point at that, at that point in time. So, Jeff, when you guys ran off the mountain, I mean, what happened? What did you guys, what did you guys say to each other? What, you know, what did you get when you got home or whatever? Okay, uh, we get to the bottom finally after about 20 minutes of struggling. You know, I could not get used to my legs for about a good five minutes. So we get down to the bottom of the hill, and the guy who owns the house, Tom, comes out, and he tells my uncle, hey, come over here. What was all that ruckus, man? I heard y'all coming down the mountain screaming and yelling. What the hell was going on? And my Uncle Mike walks up to him. He says, no, we just got spooked by something up there. Um, So we just, you know, we didn't feel right, so we rolled. And he didn't tell Tom nothing. Didn't tell Tom shit. So Tom's like, all right, cool. Well, next time y'all want to come back, just come on back and fish. You know, just call me first. And he goes in. So my Uncle Mike comes up with me. And, you know, me and Rocky and my dad are all in a circle. And we're in shock, of course. You know, I'm crying like a baby at this point. I'm so emotional. Like, every emotion you could possibly feel has come, has come over me. And I'm crying like a baby. And my Uncle Mike says, when he comes up to us, you know, guys, this is crazy. But... Jeff, you can't go around telling people what you've seen. People are going to think you're crazy. Your family might even try to throw you in the money bin. You know, we know what we've seen, but we got to make a pack right here and now. We cannot say nothing to nobody. Not you, Rocky, your dad, nor I can say a word. Promise us you'll keep it a secret. Let's make a pack. So I did. You know? But I got to be honest with you. From the time I did that, man, my life spiraled out of control. I struggled with alcohol after that. I struggled with drugs after that. I just recently got sober six years ago. Like, wow. I went down, all the way downhill after that. I can only imagine what <clears throat> seeing something like that would do, um, especially since you had the, the two encounters prior. I mean, it built up built up for you, and then it finally showed you what, what, <laughs> what it was. You know, we didn't have to suppress it. That was, I think, what really yeah. was hard on me was having to keep it a secret, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that would be a psychological. So hit. it just took me, you know, and it engulfed me. The whole thing just consumed me. But, you know, recently, the reason why I decided to let it all out is because my fiance, she just got diagnosed with uh, rare lung disease, RBILD, and she's got like three to five years to live. So mm-hmm. I sat down with her and told her, and I said, Do you think I should tell the world again you know, what, what happened to me, or do you think I should keep it a secret? She said, No, God knows, huh? She said, what are you doing? Are you crazy? You're crazy to not let it out there and let people know and push for the truth. You know? So I did. And it's gotten so big here lately, you know, doing interviews with people and you guys too. You know, like 
I've even, I've got my first two books written about it, done, complete. They're sitting at a publisher. I'm just waiting. I've got many of them in line, but they're not, you know, it's just so hard to, to pay for publishing at this point. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't afford it. Right. Like, I'm just waiting for somebody to come at me <laughs> and help me get it done. And I look, I feel like it will be done eventually. You know what I mean? So I'm just going to be patient with it all. Yeah. There are several self-publishing. Oh, yeah. Avenues. And also another place. Um, I don't know if you guys ever heard of it, Voyage Media. I have an appointment with him April 27th about the manuscript of my books for maybe a possible movie idea. That's just coming Friday. Oh, okay. So it's getting out there. You know, my story's getting, you right. know, <clears throat> it's getting through to people. Well, we're going to get around, grow up and get bigger. So let's see what happens with it. We're going to expose this as much as we can for you. So, uh, you'll help, you'll help us get, get exposed too. So it works out both ways. Right on, brother. I appreciate you for having me on your show. No problem. Hey, question for you though. Yes. What do you think Bigfoot? I mean, what do you think? Do you think these things are flesh and blood creatures? Do you think they, they have been around? What, what's your theory on Bigfoot? In general, my theory. Okay, well, since all the research and stuff I've done, I really come to the conclusion. Like, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I have to say at this point, my opinion would be that they are half and half. I think they're like a hybrid hominid. Is what I'm kind of leaning towards. Like, there could be a you know mixture of several species in with that as well. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But that's the kind of angle that I'm leaning towards at this point. Like, there's a mixture of you know a primate and human. And something, you know, maybe one or two other species of something as well. Do you think, do you think they're related? Do you think they're spiritual at all or or paranormal? Oh, God, yes. God, yes. I have to tell you, in my case, being an identical twin and losing my brother at birth, I was, you know, I was blessed with, you know, I think I'm a little more intuitive and um, I'm so empathetic to things out there in life, wildlife and fishing and stuff. Like, I just feel like then things, you know, Sasquatch, I feel like we are kind of like, it just seems like every time I'm in the woods, I have something go on. And I even had the guy from Sasquatch Theory, uh, a buddy of mine over there, said that <clears throat> it feels like they're kind of maybe drawn to me. You know, if there's ever one close, it feels like, you know, that somehow, some way, there's some type of connection just because I guess he thinks that they feel like I'm not a threat and they know that, you know, like I'm a pure soul and I would not hurt anything, you know? Yeah. But... They still give you the warning, you know, if you get too close by throwing rocks, you know. Well, and as well, and as well, you know, when they throw the rocks as well, they're saying, "Hey, not only are they saying, hey, you know, this is my spot. Watch it, you know, stay close to where you are. Don't wander too far off." They're also just leaving a message, that, "Hey, you know, that's my creek too. So whatever you catch, well, why don't you leave me something too, you know, before you leave?" Mm-hmm. You know. Well, one thing I was going to say was um, either you're. You have coincidences or you're lucky or there's just quite a few around your area where you're at. And I was looking on a map um, outside of Cincinnati. There's a lot of um, some deep wooded areas and some refuges and whatnot where these things could be could be hanging out. Yes. Saltport Lake. Yeah. Saltport Lake is a hot spot right now. And if you go uh, south of yourself there, if you go south, I mean, you're really getting into some um, heavy duty oh, stuff. Better there. believe it. Better believe it. Absolutely. So how long? Like I said, it's blown up. They're they're out there, and their their numbers are growing, and that's why we're starting to get a lot more sighting. You know. Do you do you get out in the woods and fish a lot now, Jeff? No, no. <laughs> it all changed that day, that, that night. I'll say it all changed. No, I do, but it's always in the daytime. Uh-huh. You know, when I do go, it's always in the day, broad gotcha. daylight. Gotcha. Do you think? Would you like to see one again? Oh, yeah. I've already thought about going up there at times, maybe at night. And, you know, somewhere down the line in the future, see where things go. Maybe, you know, take a crew of people with me up there, mm-hmm. maybe one night. Mm-hmm. I have thought about it. Well, I'll tell you what, Jeff. We are going to be in Lexington, Kentucky uh, in November for a crypto um, convention that's going on down there. So uh, we'll let you know when we're there and maybe come down and say hi and check check things out. Love to. I'd love to. All right, man. Well, we appreciate you coming on the show. Appreciate you telling your stories and, and getting it out there. Uh, the more people that hear these things, I think the more people that, that may start believing in these things. Absolutely, brother. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me today. All right. Thank you for being on. You're welcome. Well, that was a really great show. Another great show in the books, man. Uh, Jeff really had some interesting stories to tell for sure. Yeah, those are three good stories. 
I'm glad he had the time to come talk to us. Yeah, me too. Me too. Always, always get these guys on here, and uh, the more the better that we can expose these these sightings and encounters and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we had some uh, some recording issue, connect- connectivity issues there. I think we still got a good show out of it, and I hope everybody's gonna still enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. Yeah. I can't wait to listen to it myself. <laughs> All right, Brian, you have a good one, man. We're going to get out of here until next uh, episode. Too. Right on. Once you're out in the woods, keep your eyes and ears open. Let us know what you hear and see. Right on. Take care, man. See ya.